Many Christians use Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17 to validate the claim that Jewish practices are now obsolete. In this video, I'm going to show you why that interpretation of the text is implausible, and then I'm going to build a case for a revised translation and interpretation of the text that understands Paul within, not against, Second Temple Judaism. Let's start by looking at the NASB translation of Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Notice how Jewish practices are described as a mere shadow in contrast to the substance which belongs to Christ. About this verse, Pastor John MacArthur comments, the ceremonial aspects of the Old Testament law, dietary regulations, festivals, sacrifices, were mere shadows pointing to Christ. Since Christ, the reality has come, the shadows have no value. The tendency to diminish Jewish practices is revealed even more starkly in paraphrases like the Living Bible, which paraphrases Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 in the following way. So don't let anyone criticize you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating Jewish holidays and feasts or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these were only temporary rules that ended when Christ came. They were only shadows of the real thing, of Christ himself. Keep in mind the Living Bible was the best-selling book in America in 1972, 1973, and by 1997 it sold over 40 million copies. This paraphrase sends the clear message that Jewish practices are now obsolete since Jesus has come. But is this really what Paul means to say in this verse? I don't think so, and here's why. In Colossians 4 verse 10 through 11, Paul honors Jewish followers of Jesus who maintain a Jewish life of faithfulness to the Torah, which means that any reading which understands Paul's words as an elimination of Jewish feasts and practices for Jews misses the meaning of the text. In Colossians 4 verse 10 through 11, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you, for these are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. In this text, Paul identifies Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice as the ones of the circumcision. And this is key because for Paul and in Second Temple Judaism in general, circumcision was more than just a single commandment. It meant that one was a Jew, which entailed a commitment to obey the whole Torah. Here are some examples from Second Temple Jewish sources that demonstrate this to be the case. The Jewish historian Josephus, who is writing at the end of the first century CE, recounts what the Hasmonean ruler Hyrcanus did to the Idumeans. Josephus writes, Hyrcanus permitted the people of Idumea to remain in their country so long as they had themselves circumcised and were willing to observe the laws of the Jews. And so, out of attachment to the land of their fathers, they submitted to circumcision and to making their manner of life conform in all other respects to that of the Jews. And from that time on, they have continued to be Jews. In this account, Hyrcanus forces the Idumeans, who were non-Jews, to become Jews, and the way he did this was through the rite of circumcision. And Josephus indicates that circumcision entailed observing all the laws of the Jews, meaning the Torah. In essence, to be circumcised meant to be a Jew, and to be a Jew meant to observe the whole Torah. Dr. Shea J.D. Cohen rightly observes, of all the practices and customs of the Jews, Josephus singles out circumcision. For him, to adopt the customs of the Jews and to be circumcised are synonymous expressions. In Second Temple Judaism, being circumcised not only meant you fulfilled a single commandment, it meant that the one who was circumcised committed themselves to take on the responsibility to obey the whole Torah. And Paul makes the same point in Galatians 5.3, when he rebukes Gentiles desiring circumcision. Again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to keep the whole Torah.
In this text, Paul is rebuking Gentiles because he wants them to remain Gentiles and not become Jews. And what we learn from this text is that Paul embraces the meaning of circumcision in Second Temple Judaism. If one receives circumcision, they would enter into the Jewish way of life. They would become responsible to observe the whole Torah. And this is key because in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 through 18, Paul writes, I give this rule in all of Messiah's communities. Was anyone called when he already had been circumcised? Let him not make himself uncircumcised. Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Let him not allow himself to be circumcised. And in verse 20, Paul says, Let each one remain in the calling in which he was called. Paul's instruction for all Messiah's communities is that Jews should remain circumcised, meaning they should live as Jews by observing the Torah in all its facets. And Gentiles should remain Gentiles even after they dedicate their lives to Messiah. Which means that when Paul identifies himself as circumcised in Philippians 3 verse 5, he is indicating that he too remains Torah observant as a follower of Jesus. Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. David Rudolph rightly explains, Paul's bottom line, his rule, is that Jews who follow Jesus, like Paul himself, should remain in their calling as Jews and not assimilate. With this context in mind, Paul's identification of Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice as those of the circumcision in Colossians 4 verse 11 means that he understands these Jewish followers of Jesus continue to live Torah-observant lives. And it is these Jews that Paul tells the Colossians are his co-workers for the kingdom of God in Colossians 4 verse 11. Paul honors these Jews before the Colossians and places them on his level working for the purpose of God's kingdom. For Paul, Jewish followers of Jesus, living a life of faithfulness to the Torah is honorable. And this, of course, would include the specific practices mentioned in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17. Therefore, it is implausible that Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 is saying the very commandments that Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice continue to observe have no value. We can now move forward in our attempt to understand Paul's words in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 in light of the fact that he expects Jewish followers of Jesus to observe the whole Torah. I argue that Paul is exhorting the non-Jewish Colossians to not let ascetic critics who emphasize self-denial judge them for eating and drinking, celebrating Shabbat and Jewish festivals instead of fasting and afflicting themselves. He's telling the Colossians to not consider the judgment from the critics, but instead they should consider the Messiah's body keeping their minds focused on Jesus and what he did for them. I'll read my translation towards the end of the video, so be sure to keep watching to the end. And to translate the text, I'm going to be relying on much of the arguments and translation decisions made by Brian Allen in his peer-reviewed article, Removing an Arrow from the Supersessionist Quiver, a post-supersessionist reading of Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17. And I'll link his article in the description below. So let's get into this. In the article, he interacts with the NASB translation of Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17. So let's read that again as a point of reference. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. First, what does Paul mean by food and drink? Many commentators think this refers to Jewish dietary restrictions, and many Christians assume this, which is reinforced by comments like the following from the ESV Study Bible, which says, Christians are no longer obligated to observe Old Testament dietary laws, food, and drink. I agree with the point that Gentile Christians are not obligated to observe Jewish dietary laws. These laws were specifically given to Israel in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Foods such as pork and shellfish are unclean for Jewish people. They are not unclean for Gentiles. And this idea is reinforced in Acts 15. But when we read Colossians 2 verse 16 in its literary and historical context, we see that Paul is not even discussing Jewish dietary laws. He is countering the ascetic critics who were chastising the Colossians for celebrating Shabbat and Jewish festivals with eating and drinking instead of fasting and self-affliction. 
Paul discusses this particular ascetic philosophy beginning in Colossians 2 verse 8, when he says, See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men and the principles of the world rather than Messiah. Paul wants to ensure the Colossians to not get taken captive by this particular philosophy. And in verse 21, Paul quotes those who subscribe to it. They say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Paul calls these human commands and teachings. And this description of ascetic practices is right in line with the cynic philosophy of Crates, who teaches his followers in Epistle 14, which was written in the first century CE. Accustom yourselves to eat barley cake and to drink water and not taste fish and wine. New Testament scholar Dr. Troy Martin explains, Cynic self-sufficiency and desire for liberty result in a repudiation of foods and beverages that are products of human society. Wine is avoided because it makes the cynic dependent upon the wine industry. Cakes and delicacies are refused since they bind the cynic to the accomplished chef. This context helps us locate the philosophy that Paul is probably addressing in Colossians 2. Allen argues that Paul is dealing with ascetics who are criticizing the Colossians because on days normally associated with fasting and afflicting oneself, the Colossians are celebrating Shabbat and Jewish festivals. And I think he's right. Anyone with this ascetic worldview would be against the observance of such Jewish holy days because of the drinking of wine and eating lots of tasty foods. Concerning Shabbat, the author of Jubilees writes, For great is the honor which the Lord has given Israel, to eat, drink, and be filled on this festal day. With this context in mind, we can better translate the words Paul uses in Colossians 2 verse 16, brose and passe. According to the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, in Colossians 2 verse 16, brose is the act of partaking of food, eating. Passe is the act of drinking, drinking. So a literal translation of Colossians 2 verse 16a is, Therefore, let no one judge you in eating or in drinking. This is a good starting point as we read Colossians 2 verse 16 in context. Paul is not referring to kosher laws. He's talking about the activity of eating and drinking itself. Now let's dig into the translation problems with the NASB's translation of Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17. We'll start with the description of Shabbat and Jewish festivals as a mere shadow. Mere is the crucial word in this translation that leads to the anti-Torah interpretation. But get this, mere is not there. It's not in the Greek. It's not even implied. Colossians 2, verse 17 does not describe these Jewish practices as a mere shadow, or as the NRSV says, only a shadow. It just says a shadow, which is a positive description once you look at ancient Jewish literature. In the Babylonian Talmud, Berachot 57b, the rabbis say, Shabbat is one sixteenth of the world to come. I think Paul's imagery of Shabbat as a shadow of what is to come is a good parallel. A taste of perfection is an amazing thing. Shabbat is a taste of the world to come. As Dr. Susanna Heschel writes, The Sabbath is a metaphor for paradise and a testimony to God's presence. In our prayers, we anticipate the messianic era that will be a Sabbath, and each Shabbat prepares us for that experience. Shabbat is exciting. It is a shadow of things to come. And so are Jewish festivals. In his book, From Sabbath to Sabbath, Daniel Lancaster makes some key observations in this regard. The Sabbath and holidays foreshadow the redemption, the messianic era, the kingdom on earth, and the world to come. Passover, the festival of redemption, points toward the final redemption. Just as God redeemed Israel from Egypt at the first Passover, he will redeem his people from the nations in the future. Pentecost, Shavuot, the festival of the giving of the Torah, points to the Messianic era, when the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. The festival of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, points to the day when the trumpet of Messiah will sound. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is a picture of the final judgment. The festival of booths, Sukkot, foreshadows the kingdom when each man will sit in the shadow of the Almighty under his own vine and fig tree, and there will be peace on earth. In this way, the holidays are shadows of things to come. Specifically, they foreshadow the Messianic era. 
describing Shabbat and Jewish festivals as a shadow of things to come is an awesome truth. A foretaste of perfection is an amazing thing. I love what Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. David Stern says about Hebrews 10 verse 1, because I think his statement also applies to Colossians 2 verse 16. He says, if one is going to add to the inspired text, the word to add is definitely or indeed. These are definitely a shadow of things to come. Another issue with the NASB's translation of Colossians 2 verse 17 is the decision to translate soma as substance in the phrase, but the substance belongs to Christ. In Dr. Sangwon Aaron Sun's essay, Ta de Soma to Christu, in Colossians 2 verse 17, he makes a crucial point that challenges the translation of soma as substance. He writes, Soma occurs 91 times in the 13 letters traditionally attributed to Paul. It is used both in the individual sense and in the corporate sense. When soma is used in the individual sense, it denotes either the physicality of a person or the whole person in a certain mode of existence. When used in the corporate sense, however, it denotes primarily the sexual union or the church as the body of Christ. The major takeaway is that Paul never uses soma to mean reality or substance. In Colossians 2 verse 17, soma means body. The complete Jewish Bible and the King James Version get this right. Let's turn back to the Greek text of Colossians 2 verse 17. A literal translation of the phrase ta de soma to Christu is, but the body of the Messiah. Do you notice anything missing in this phrase? There's no verb. This is why Bible translators have to supply the verb. And it's moments like this when the translator's theology really affects their translation. This is why I spent time explaining the significance of circumcision in Colossians 4 verse 10 through 11. When I provide a verb for verse 17, I must make sure it coheres with Paul honoring Jewish followers of Jesus who continue to practice Judaism. I translate Colossians 2 verse 17b as, But let every one of you consider the Messiah's body. This is a slightly modified version of Brian Allen's translation, and it's informed by his arguments. And in order to show you why I think Colossians 2 verse 17b should be translated this way, I will take you through two features of the Greek text. And after I go through these features, I'll wrap up by giving you the full translation of Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 to show you how it all comes together. So to start, let's look at why I supplied the verb consider to the verse. The NASB translation of Colossians 2 verse 17, along with many others, supplies the phrasal verb belongs to in the phrase, the substance belongs to Christ. In author writing in Greek could omit a word if they thought it was self-evident, but given soma means body, inserting belongs to doesn't make sense. That would read, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body belongs to the Messiah. A translation that could potentially work is the King James Version, which says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. I think the King James Version supplies the wrong verb, and here's why. Most translators and commentators assume there is an antithesis, meaning a contrast between two ideas against each other, between skia, or shadow, of Jewish practices, and soma, the substance, or the body of Messiah. But a closer look at Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 reveals that the antithesis is actually between the critics who are judging the Colossians and what the Colossians should be focusing on. Let's unpack this explanation, and I just want to let you know this does get technical. The antithesis begins in verse 16 and ends in verse 17 because in Greek, when the negative adverb me is followed by the conjunction de, this forms an antithesis. Look at these words in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17. Let no one, me, judge you, but de, the body of the Messiah. Brian Allen's solution to the missing verb in Colossians 2 verse 17 is to insert the phrase, let everyone consider, which he thinks is implied by the antithesis that Paul constructs. And when translating the text, we should include this phrase in the verse to make the meaning clearer for the reader. The Greek word for judge in the first part of the antithesis, let no one judge, is krinoto. This word has a range of meanings, both positive and negative. And because the first krinato has a negative meaning, the supplied krinato in the second part of the antithesis must have a positive meaning. 
As Dr. Troy Martin writes, the prohibition in the first clause of the antithesis in Colossians 2 verse 16 indicates that the nuance of crinito is negative. However, the action enjoined by the second clause requires a positive nuance. Thus, Allen posits that crinito should be translated as consider in verse 17. Furthermore, the first part of the antithesis reads, let no one judge you. The second part reads, but consider the body of the Messiah. Because the first part of the antithesis is, let no one judge, we should supply everyone in the second part of the antithesis. Because in the first part, Paul says, no one. A second feature of the Greek text that we need to unpack is what does Paul refer to when he describes the body of the Messiah, Soma tu Christu. Brian Allen argues that this refers to the corporate body of Christ, which could work considering Paul refers to the corporate body of Messiah followers in Colossians 1 verse 18, Colossians 1 24, 2 verse 19, and 3 15. The way Allen reads Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 is as follows. He says, Paul is not writing to the Colossians to exhort them not to let legalistic Torah-observant Jews condemn them for their erroneous observance or lack of observance altogether. Rather, Paul is writing to encourage the Colossians in their praxis by equating their praxis with a shadow of things to come, and not to let others judge the Colossians' participation in these practices. It is the corporate body of Christ and its practices are to be judged and considered by the critics so that those critics might also be persuaded to join this messianic movement and share in the hope and inheritance. Allen is arguing that Paul has the non-Jesus following critics in mind in Colossians 2 verse 17. They are the ones who should consider joining the corporate body of Christ. This is where I disagree with Alan. I think Paul is specifically addressing the Colossian community in verse 17. He's not telling the ascetic critics to consider the corporate body of Christ. He's telling the Colossians to consider the Messiah's physical resurrected body instead of the judgment coming from the critics. Here are the reasons why. First, in Colossians 2 verse 18, Paul follows up his exhortation in verses 16 and 17 by telling the Colossians, Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking. If Paul has two groups in mind in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17, the Colossian community and the ascetic critics, then it would make sense for him to address both groups again in the next verse, and that's exactly what he does. Paul's point in Colossians 2 is to prevent the Colossians from being taken in by the philosophy of the critics. Again, Colossians 2 verse 8 reads, See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and the basic principles of the world rather than Messiah. Here, Paul refers to the ascetic critics with the same Greek phrase, metis, as he does in Colossians 2 verse 16. And in Colossians 2 verse 8, he does this as a way to contrast the Colossian community with the critics. This increases the likelihood that in Colossians 2 verse 17, when Paul is saying, let everyone consider, he is specifically speaking to the Colossian Jesus followers. So for the benefit of the reader, I think we should add the words of you in verse 17 to specify the everyone Paul is speaking of are the Colossians. Colossians 2 verse 17b would then read, but let every one of you consider the body of the Messiah. Now, why do I think Paul is talking about Jesus' resurrected body when he says, let every one of you consider the body of the Messiah? Well, it's because of Colossians 2 verse 12 through 13, which says, You were buried along with him in immersion, through which you also were raised with him by trusting in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he pardoned us all our transgressions. Paul encourages the Colossians to focus on the truth of what Jesus the Messiah did for them. Through his death and resurrection, their sins are forgiven. They were once spiritually dead, but God made them alive with Jesus. In Colossians 3 verse 1 through 4, Paul goes on to say, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Messiah, keep seeking the things above, where Messiah is, sitting at the right hand of God. Focus your mind on things above, 
not on things on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Messiah in God. When Messiah, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Colossians 3 verse 2 is especially significant. Focus your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What we can draw from these texts to help us understand Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 is that the critics may be judging the Colossian community, but Paul is exhorting them to not focus on their criticism. Instead, they should consider the Messiah's resurrected body. They should keep their minds focused on Yeshua, his death and resurrection, and what that means they now and will experience. With all that, here is the translation that I think best reflects Paul's words in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17. Therefore, no one is to judge you regarding eating or drinking, or in respect to a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, things which are a shadow of what is to come. But let every one of you consider the Messiah's body. To recap, the conventional Christian interpretation of Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 suggests that Shabbat, Jewish festivals, and kosher laws are no longer binding because of Jesus' coming. This interpretation cannot be maintained because in chapter 4 of the very same letter, Paul honors Jewish followers of Jesus, those from the circumcision, who are observing Shabbat, Jewish festivals, and maintaining a kosher diet. Not only this, but when we understand that to be circumcised meant to be Torah observant, Paul says he's Torah observant himself. Paul was a Torah observant Jew who participated in the same practices as his Jewish co-workers. This means, according to Paul, Jewish practices are not obsolete. They continue to have value. Jews should observe them, and Gentiles can. Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 does not validate the cessation of Jewish practices. A more historically plausible reading of this text is that Paul is exhorting the Colossians to not take seriously the judgments coming from the ascetic critics who chastise them for eating and drinking, celebrating Shabbat and Jewish festivals instead of fasting and afflicting themselves. The Colossians should not receive the judgments from the critics. Instead, they should consider the Messiah's body, keeping their minds focused on Jesus and what he did for them. Before I conclude this video, I do want to make a few comments about Paul's audience in Colossians and the application of Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 for Gentile followers of Jesus today. In Colossians, Paul is speaking primarily to Gentiles in the Colossian community. Because in Colossians 1 verse 27, Paul says, God chose to make known to them this glorious mystery regarding the Gentiles, which is Messiah among you, the hope of glory. This text indicates that Paul's second person you in Colossians 1 verse 27 through 2 verse 17 is Gentiles. This means that in Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17, Paul is primarily speaking to Gentiles who are celebrating Shabbat and Jewish festivals. An application relevant to Messianic Judaism is that Colossians 2 verse 16 through 17 is a great text justifying one of Messianic Judaism's major claims. Gentiles do not have a covenantal responsibility to obey the whole Torah, but those who are led are free to participate in Jewish ways of life and worship. But just because those who are led to live in Jewish ways of life and worship can do this, that does not mean that all Christians should. Acts 15 is absolutely clear. There's more to be said here, which is why the Gentiles' relationship to Torah will be a primary topic we discuss on this channel. For more on this, check out Eric's video, The Shema's Impact on the Gospel and Replacement Theology. And stay tuned for our next video about good and bad reasons to be a Messianic Gentile, a non-Jewish member of a Messianic Jewish synagogue who worships and lives according to the Jewish norms of their congregation. If you want to watch that video or you're just interested in exploring Messianic Judaism and the Jewishness of the New Testament more generally, please hit the subscribe button so you can join us on Two Messianic Jews. And as always, if you would like to share your thoughts on anything I've said, whether you agree or whether you disagree, leave your comment below. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.